This episode of History Saver is brought to you by Addressing Gettysburg. Addressing Gettysburg is a podcast that shares great experiences, quality programs, awesome guests, and is a welcoming community for all who love Gettysburg. So join in with host Matt Callery and find out why Addressing Gettysburg is one of the top rated podcasts online today. You can find them on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, CastBox, Podbean, Google Podcasts, TuneIn, and on Instagram, Facebook, and of course, right here on YouTube. So check out Addressing Gettysburg today, where history is not boring. Thank you to Addressing Gettysburg for sponsoring this video. You're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. So we've moved in this portion of the Chickamauga battlefield off of Battle Line Road here. And we're going to talk a little bit about what's going to start happening tonight. It's September the 19th into the morning of September the 20th, 1863 in this area. So the morning of September the 20th, 1863 is going to culminate the decisive day of battle. The Federals are driven off of the field and you see several Georgia monuments across the road back here. And then you got two brigade, Georgia brigades through the woods. And this is representing also the northern end of the Union Army left flank of George Thomas's 14th Corps. He is the commander of the 14th Corps. He fell back and deployed his troops on the low ridge that runs north and south. And this is a historic field look by the National Park Service. This has been restored by the National Park Service to kind of give you an idea of what field the battle looked like here uh, in September of 1863. The vegetation was real low cut. You can see more deer. Uh, we've seen deer everywhere we went. But you can see how the vegetation is kind of cleared. And this is what it looked like here. There were hogs, there were cows, there were, you know, grazing animals here that was helping to keep that vegetation off the ground and then of course the big um thing here also at the time was firewood you had to have firewood to heat your homes so this is where you would gather your dead trees or firewoods artillery batteries and wagons can move through these woods a little bit easier than they could at some of the woods you see around here now now the night of the 19th and the morning of the 20th Rosecrans is going to hold a commander's call at Widow Glenn's house, and they're going to determine what to do on the morning of the 20th. He realized that the Confederates had been reinforced by, uh, they had been reinforced. Bragg's army was getting reinforcements from Ringgold, and they were getting reinforcements really from all over. Now, overall, Bragg has 70,000 men here. Rosecrans had around 58,000. General Thomas is concerned with the left flank. Now, you have monuments here. Some are facing east and north. And that is because this is a pivot in the line. You can see how the monuments run and then turn. And they run straight here. General Thomas is concerned with the left flank. He wanted to have a division of troops all the way back up to Reed's Bridge Road that would cut off a major Confederate approach that would help protect 
the, his left flank, but he doesn't have enough men and he's short of troops. Now, although the Confederates, uh, all through that conference, he's telling him, uh, Rosecrans, that he wants to strengthen, he wants to strengthen that left flank, but they keep saying we don't have enough troops. He wants to move troops from the Union right flank to the Union left flank. This corner of the battlefield has a powerful gravity because it's pulling troops. So all throughout the day on September the 20th in this area, troops are being moved in this direction. Bragg's plans call for a morning attack at dawn's first light at 5.30 a.m. on September the 20th. Instead, due to typical uh, the typical fashion that we think of with the Army of Northern Virginia, or excuse me, the Army of Tennessee Command, uh, and because of confusion, his attack doesn't launch until around 9 or 9.30 a.m. on the 20th. And the Confederates are able to get fresh, more, uh, more fresh troops, and Bragg has almost an entire corps of Daniel Harvey Hill, who has two divisions, uh, also up under Patrick Claiborne and John C. Breckenridge has around 10,000 troops. They move overnight and put into positions in the east and northeast, and his plan is very much the same as it was on the 18th and the 19th. Attack will begin ahead and push across the Lafayette Road, which is directly to our front, and then turn south across the road and push south, turning the Union left towards McLemore's Cove. And then they will drive them away from the city and hopefully destroy the Union Army. But because of command confusion, the attack begins really, really, really late. Now Breckenridge and Claiborne run into a fortified defensive line. And that defensive line is fully supported with artillery and barricades. They don't really per se dig trenches, but they do build up barricades that's said to be knee or thigh high and they make a difference in the combat that's going to take place here in um, Chickamauga. It's going to limit combat casualties. It's going to save men for the Union Army, and that is going to prove a very, very vital good decision for the Union Army to make. Now, this is a very strong position. Uh, position is on the slight rise. All Confederate attacks on the morning of the 20th fell because the Union had time to fortify and strengthen these positions. So despite Confederate attack after attack after attack, Bragg's plan is seeming to fail. That's not going to hold. But at the time, until 11 a.m. that morning, Bragg's plan is looking like a failure because of the decisions the Union Army is making here to make a defensive stand with fortified positions. So walking through here, looking at some of these monuments, you got the 33rd Ohio Infantry, the acorn at the top. These troops are commanded by Oscar F. Moore. Uh, and this is part of Scriber's Brigade, Barnes, uh, Barr's Division of the 14th Army Corps. And then as we walk, walk along here, you've got some flank markers here. I suppose that's what that's going to be. Uh, there's no writing, as I can see on this thing. Yeah. But then you have some... War tablet markers here of Bard's Division, Thomas's Corps, General Abislam Bard, September 20th, 1863, till 6 p.m. And then if we walk over here, you've got a very ornate monument here to the 2nd Ohio Infantry. And this is Scriber's Brigade, Barnes Division, 14th Army Corps. You can see their token acorn here. So... If you come here, you're going to see all kinds of neat monuments here on the battlefield. All right, so we are going to hop in and we're going to continue this tour of the Chickamauga battlefield and talk a little bit more about what occurs on September the 20th, 1863. So we have moved locations here and this is what we call Brotherton Field. You can see the Brotherton cabin in the distance here. And this is where the Confederate breakthrough occurs and a battle changes course into Bragg's favor on September the 20th. Now, there are some confusion, there's a lot of confusion actually in this location, but it is not all the Army of Tennessee that's having the confusion. The Union Army has confusion and miscommunication and something very famous for the Battle of Chickamauga is going to occur here. On the morning of the 20th, 
James Negley's division of Thomas's Corps held this position where we now stand in keeping with the gravity pull, and Thomas wanted to extend the line further north, and he wants Negley's division to come, and he communicates that at 6.30 a.m. on the 20th, he, he, he tells him that. 6.30 a.m. on the 20th, he tells him. He wants him here. Well, he is bombarded with as many as 14 separate couriers around this location. And these couriers are coming with different messages and commands. And largely before the Confederates, the attacks began from the Confederates, uh, between 8 and 8.30, Negley pulls out of his position and Rosecrans, through a series of communication errors, will put one division in and then will put a second General Thomas J. Woods division. And they will come in here, and this becomes one of the most famous controversies of the entire battle. A courier informs General Rosecrans that there is a gap that General Joseph Reynolds is flanked and exposed because John Brandon's division has pulled out of line, and it's not true. He almost moves back, but then moves back into the line of battle. And confusion during this time is fast moving. The battle uh, is moving really fast. And our, uh, Rosecrans issues a famous order to Wood for Wood to close up and support Reynolds. Now, this can go two ways of meanings here. This can mean that he wants Reynolds to move up and shift laterally on the front to preserve the gap. But he can also um, support which means move up and out of line behind Reynolds and form a support, uh, supporting front line. General Wood gets to order and debates what to do McCook, and utterly McCook and Thomas decide they would have to move. They pull the line back and fall back through the woods here to the north to find Reynolds. Because Wood's flank is not currently tied in with uh, Reynolds, he doesn't know where he is needed. And he doesn't know if there's another division between. This confusion creates a gap where there's no gap that existed in the first place. So trying to not have a gap, they create a gap. And this existed, um, this takes place around 11.15 on the uh, morning of the 20th. And after several hours of fruitless fighting along the battle line uh, road, General Longstreet receives word that Bragg has ordered a complete or general advance which means everyone is to attack bragg orders couriers down the line to each division these couriers are telling his divisions we're going across we're going across we're going across and law street sends word that his whole corps overnight um since you know he brings up his whole whole corps overnight and bragg divided this army into two wings polk commands the right wing Longstreet is given six divisions on the left wing, even though he's new here on the field. And he orders his whole corps forward. Longstreet is 600 yards ahead of where we are now, and they do not know about the gap here in this line. They don't know there's a gap here. They have no knowledge of that, and that has been debated over time. But the, the truth of it is they don't know this. So on the 20th, the federal line is a long tree line. And as a result, a breakthrough of battle occurs here. Longstreet has an assault column of 11,000 men. And overall, he commands 20,000 men. And that is 20,000 men that is in his wing, made up of five or, or six divisions. And it moved forward as a mass. And they turn north and a Union line is rolled up. Rolled up in this is about around one-third of the Union Army. And as a result, one-third of that Union Army is driven away from this field. This position is one of the most decisive places on the entire Chickamauga, uh, Chickamauga battlefield. At 11.30, uh, between 11.30 and 1 p.m., which is an hour and a half, Bragg wins a significant victory in this location. So this is the most decisive place, probably, other than Snodgrass Hill, this is the most decisive place 
on this entire battlefield. And standing here, I could tell you, if you're a Union regiment along this tree line here, along these woods in this field, there's a little knoll that you can see right here. I can't see over that. So you have an instructive view here as well. And this is what makes coming to these battlefields and seeing it for yourself explain more of the battle to you. More than what you could ever read in books, you need to see the terrain. You have the Brotherton cabin off to our front, which is really cool to see the recreation of that. It was destroyed here during the battle. But you've got this ground that you could come and look at. Even though a lot of it is covered in woodland that would not have been woodland at the time, you've got this portion that's kind of cleared out. Uh, the National Park Service did a good job at making this appear like it did in 1863. But this terrain speaks for itself. So we're uh, taking a little stroll right now because I wanna kind of show you the woods for yourself as I'm walking in. And this is in the Union positions here. And this is where Reynolds is going to come through. And I gotta tell you, I'm gonna turn you around. It is uh, very neat to say that I'm walking through the woods here in the same footsteps as these men did here in Chickamauga. All right, so this is Ben Brotherton Field. You can see the Brotherton cabin and field behind me. And we're going to keep talking about the September 20th action here at Chickamauga and why what occurs here on September 20th was so important. But this is ultimately where Bragg is going to start to turn the tide of this battle back into Confederate favor. So we're gonna get in the car, we're gonna continue on, and we'll see you on the next spot in the battlefield in about one second. So we are here in the approximate spot of where General Hood is going to be wounded on September the 20th, 1863, and nearly killed in a injury that most men did not survive during the war. Uh, but before we go out there, I do wanna show you some prominent figures um, and landmarks in this fight. This is going to be where General Longstreet's um, Corps is going to come up under Major General John B. Hood on the 20th of September, 1863. And if you look down here, you've got um, General John B. Hill, uh, B. Hood's division, who's made up of Johnson's division, or his brigade rather, that's made up of Johnson's division, McLaws' division, Hood's division, and the reserve artillery up under Major General Felix H. Robertson. And this is going to be the field of the 20th actions. This is going to be um, one of the typical places that you're going to think about when you think about the Battle of Chickamauga. So let's go in, let's talk a little bit about John uh, Bell Hood and what happens here um, during this time frame. So we're gonna make our way to the John B. Hood wounded um, spot where he's mortally wounded but we're just uh walking through where long street's headquarters is going to be in this area on the 20th of september and there's of course some markers here that you probably want to come and take a look at they're spread throughout the woods so you really got to come and look at them for yourself and this one is really hard to see in person you may be able to see it better on camera, um, but this has been here for quite a while. And then if you look over here, this is a pyramid. This is how, uh, unlike Gettysburg with the um, cannons, this is how they denote the mortal wounding spots um, where someone has fell or headquarters here in Chickamauga. And it's denoted by how tall these pyramids are. This is the pyramid that denotes that this was Longstreet's headquarters on September the 20th here in Chickamauga on this section of the field. As the battle is starting to rage down and really make its culmination here. And this is where your winning actions, as I say, is going to occur. So pretty cool uh, to see this. This is the headquarters of Longstreet's Corps of John Bell Hood. And Pretty neat to see this in person. So John Bell Hood is gonna be here with his headquarters around September the 20th, 1863 at noon. We're gonna head across the road here 
and we're going to go see where John Bell Hood is wounded on the afternoon of the 20th. And I'm going to take you along with me for the walk because I'll give you a chance to see some of this awesome terrain here on the battlefield here at Chickamauga. 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 <laughs> I'm telling you, after so much talking this morning, words get tripped up. So, two spot where General Hood is wounded. So, moving with the leading formations, his job is to turn the attack column uh, from the west where the federal opposition has dissipated, and he's going to try to turn it to the north where the federal resistance is going to go on the high ground of Horseshoe Ridge, which is directly to the tree line in front of us there. Now, the brigade in the field ahead of us is going to see this. They're going to see the troops up there, and they're going to come running back off of that hill in front of us. Now, what John Bell Hood is going to do is he's going to run out in the middle of the field on his horse, and he's going to attempt to rally them. So he is mounted at the time, and he is going to be shot in the right leg in the upper thigh region. Now, this injury is going to almost shatter his right thigh bone. It's badly mangled. He is moved to a core hospital behind the lines. And that is going to be somewhere in the area of Reed's Bridge Road. Ultimately, his leg is amputated below the right hip joint. Now, the survival rate of this injury is really, really low. Most men do not survive this typical type of injury you see on the battlefield. He, as a matter of fact, this injury uh, survival rate is so low that newspapers start to say that John Bell Hood is dead. Well, they come back after they found out he indeed survived the wound, and they revise that. Now, the impact of his fall is that there are no other corps commanders to take command of his three divisions, and Longstreet takes a while to learn of it, and then he takes a longer time to put someone over it. And he really doesn't really appoint a lieutenant general over this. Now, this is going to cause the assault column to be leaderless, and they kind of go off in their separate directions. And uh, unfortunately... This is going to occur to John, this is going to happen to John Bell Hood as he's trying to rally these men that's coming off of this hill, retreating in this spot. So, yeah, not a good situation for John Bell Hood or the Confederate Army. They're going to lose one of their most vital leaders who you know of through the Gettysburg campaign as well. So this is where John B. Hood is not going to die thankfully but is going to lose his right leg for the rest of his life um, but his actions here were one of heroic proportions as he tried to rally these men so pretty cool to see that spot and now we are going to head to the culmination of this battle that is going to take place at a place called Snodgrass Hill that is going to be the last ditch effort by General Thomas here at Chickamauga. So let's head over there and talk about the conclusion of this battle and some of the aftermath of the things that's going to take place on that hill and what's going to happen after this occurs. So let's go.
concluding in this episode the Chicklamaga battle here at the only place that's fitting to conclude it and that's at the Snodgrass cabin on Snodgrass Hill or Horseshoe Hill as some uh, refer to it but this is a very neat place for me to stand in because this is one of the places I've wanted to stand in in a Civil War battlefield since I was a kid. So it's pretty neat to be standing right here on Snodgrass Hill where it's going to all end for the Union Army on the 20th of September, 1863. Now we drove up here today. We didn't have to make the assaults up this hill, but it's very steep. And let's... uh. Let's explore this place a little bit and talk a little bit about what happens here at Snodgrass Hill. So in the aftermath of the breakthrough and the Union Army is drove off the field with one third of the army gone, two or three corps of commanders, General Crichton, McCook, and Rosecrans, they end up leaving the only one that's left, and that's General Thomas. And he is here on Snodgrass Hill in the area you see here now he witnesses hood's wounding and the open line of monuments is where they fell back on that spot and as more troops get here confederates move west to outflank this line and turn it around at two in the afternoon thomas after his initial line is formed he gets word that johnston is coming from the west and he sees a column of troops approaching because the tree line was not what it is now. And he gets nervous. For the first time in the history of his command, he is nervous. So he is standing here on Snodgrass Hill. He is nervous. He's got his beard between his hands. And he hands his field glasses to one of his superiors, or one of his uh, men here. And he says, here, you take a look. And he takes a look out and... He uh, ends up sending a courier out then at that time after he confirms he sees some guys too or call them the troops moving up. He sends a courier out to tell him who it is and to kind of uh, help ease his mind a little bit because he's getting very nervous. He knows the Union line, one third of them are gone. He's one of the last left. So you got General Thomas is going to be up here on the afternoon. He's going to have his line spread out through here. And he's going to be getting nervous. He doesn't know what's going on in Kelly's field. He doesn't have any clue what's going on and with the Union lines. He, he is vir virtually clueless. So this is going to be the culmination of what's going to happen here. You've got Snodgrass House here. You've got a very cool witness tree there. That was no doubt here during the battle. It's a large cedar, so it's probably here during the battle. And it's probably a witness tree. And very cool to be standing on this spot right here at Snodgrass Hill. So this is where it is all going to end for the Union Army during the Battle of Chickamauga. Let's get out of here and wrap this thing up, shall we? All right, so we're breaking in the middle of the episode here because I kind of want to give you an idea of what we're talking about when we refer to the Lee and Gordon Mill site where they're thinking that the culmination of the forces are going to be built up at. There's a very famous photograph taken here at Chickamauga uh, sometime around the time frame right after the battle. And we'll show you where that photograph was actually taken from in just a minute. But we're going to turn you around. We're going to show you the Lee and Gordon Mill site and talk a little bit about why it was important here um, before we continue on in this episode. This is the Lee and Gordon Mill site. This was here during the war and this is where a concentration of troops is going to build up not far from here uh rosecrans is going to have his headquarters in a home here and this is what is thought to be one of the main targets well it just doesn't play out like that directly behind the mill site you can see off in the distance the hill that is going to be the main battlefield at chickamauga everything is everything is going to rage across the creek site in the back of this location there's going to be a little bit of fighting here but the bulk of the fighting is going to be back that way rosecrans sets up a headquarters here in a home not far from this location the day before the battle kicks off and you're going to have a very famous photograph taken 
from somewhere in this general vicinity. We'll put the original photograph up here. We're going to attempt to match that photograph up from what it looked like then to today. And I'm gonna walk right up the hill here and that photograph is going to be taken from somewhere in this vicinity. You can clearly see the building here matching up. And this is the Lee and Gordon Mill site here in Chickamauga, Georgia. So we're uh, headed back into the National uh, Park Service Chickamauga Battlefield Visitor Center here, where we began this adventure here uh, for the Battle of Chickamauga. And we're gonna go in and then conclude this episode of History Saver and let's, uh, let's do it. So we showed this in the first episode here. This is the big map here in the uh, National Park Service Visitor Center at Chickamauga. This is going to help you explore the battlefield like we did this morning. This is gonna show you where you are now. This is gonna show you the Reeds Bridge Road, the Alexander Bridge. This is going to show you Lee and Gordon's Mills, all of these key places that you're wanting to see here when you come to Chickamauga and better understand the battle. And also understand why September the 18th was important, just as important as the 19th and 20th and is often overlooked. So if you want a good resource to see here of what you're looking at over this five, over 5,000 acre landscape of this battlefield, this is what you're going to want to see when you come in here and take a minute to examine. So yeah, this is, uh, what is going to help you out as long uh, as well with National Park Service guides online. Uh, you can go to their, their, their website. They've got maps, information, different things up there. The American Battlefield Trust, Gary Edelman, Chris White, all of those guys in the American Battlefield Trust, um, Chris Mikowski at Emergent Civil War. Go check them out here on YouTube. they got some awesome guides. There's a really cool uh, driving tour on there as well. And you'll be able to see a lot of that information. There's a lot of what went into the research that I do. I watch a lot of stuff in the American Battlefield Trust, reading uh, stuff from Emergent Civil War. That is one of my main sources here. So come visit these guys, visit them online, and uh, support their cause. They're doing some great work here at Chickamauga. All right, guys, so I'm here with the National Park Service staff at the Visitor Center here at Chickamauga National Battlefield when you come here. Um, great staff here, great visitor center. There's a lot of cool things to see here. This is where you want to start and end your trip here in Chickamauga. And I got to tell you, these guys right here have been more than welcoming. And if you're here, you want to explore a cool Civil War battlefield, they've got great, great resources online. They're a great wealth of information. You can come in and ask them. They've got guided tours, programs here almost daily. And you can come take one of those for yourself. Get to know the battlefield, get to know the history of the battlefield, and a little known information about the Battle of Chickamauga. Also, Emergent Civil War, American Battlefield Trust, the History Underground, Project Pass, Vlogging Through History. Go check out all of those channels here, friends of our channel, and we're happy to support those guys. They've got great content here from Chickamauga as well. And we're going to get out of here. We're going to head back south to Alabama. We've got another trip to plan to Washington, D.C., coming up next, where we're going to be exploring the Civil War in Washington, D.C. But come visit these guys here and uh, enjoy some cool Civil War history and learn about the war here in Georgia and Tennessee.